So I'm the course coordinator for the environmental science program here in Singapore. Um, my PhD was from the University of Hong Kong um, a fair few years ago now, and my undergraduate's from the UK. So that in itself means I've moved around a bit. But it says here an itinerant ecologist. I have moved around an awful lot. Um, it's nice being able to see the world. Okay, just a brief bit more intro to who I am. Um, I said I'm from the UK originally, so I'm from the northeast of England, um, just by the Scottish border, where the waters are very cold um, and the air is even colder. Um, close to Newcastle is probably the closest city you may have heard of. And being from the UK, from England, um, we are an island nation like Singapore, a little bit bigger, but still there's really nowhere um, within the UK that's more than about 90 miles from the coastline. So as a child, you know, little people spend time um, by the coast. And you know, I was very lucky that the area I grew up in, um, very picturesque. Um, because it's so cold in the north, we don't get the volume of tourism that you get in Devon and Cornwall and down the south of England. So as a child growing up there, you, you know, this is a busy day on this beach. So seven or eight people is busy. Um, you know, miles and miles of coastline to yourself. Uh, as a kid, wandering around on the beach, picking up seaweed, playing in rock pools, um, going in fruit and free water. You know, I loved doing that as a child, and that's really, I suppose, where I am now. Um, slightly moved on from this. I was looking at this trying to figure out how old I was, and the T-shirt is E.T., which was 1982. So I'm guessing I'm about eight or nine years old here. Um, and also got a nice 10 meter swimming badge. Um, so you see, I mean, this child's always very excited and bouncy to be anywhere near the ocean. Um, and to be honest, I'm still the same. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky that the kind of area I work in is something I've always been interested in. You know, I do love what I do. Um, and there's you know, still a lot of this nine-year-old boy inside me, I suppose. Um, so I've got a PhD, got my degree, but it's the love of what I do that really drives, um, drives my research. So, are, are there any, not including my students, are there anyone here who's a, a scientist or involved in science at all? Yes. yes? Aha, okay. Ah, okay. Um, I'm sure you've all heard of marine biology. Okay, so it's the biology of all the organisms that live in the oceans and salt water. Um, marine ecology is a branch of this. So whereas in biology, which encompasses everything, you may be looking at physiology, you may be looking at biochemistry. Um, ecology is much more interested in looking at how species interact with each other and how they interact with their environment. So it's not all floating around looking at dolphins. Um, they're very nice, but very few people do that. Um, and the dolphins probably, well, at least in this picture, didn't want to hang around me. Um, so it's very much looking at I said how organisms interact with each other, how they interact with the environment, and which can lead you in all sorts of different directions as a researcher. I work on community ecology, so I'm very interested, rather than looking at these interactions with one or two species, I'm interested in looking at a whole suite of different species. So quite a wide range. So think of a marine ecosystem. This is, I've stolen this from the internet. So. Um, as I said, you know, you've got species being affected by the environment they live in. So if you've got rainwater near a coast, if you've got drainage, you've got fresh water coming into the coastline, that can affect the species there. You may have surface currents that may affect what species occur. Someone mentioned UV light earlier today. Um, increased levels of UV light can, for example, kill off um, fish eggs and the plankton. So there's all these sort of physical aspects to what's happening. But also you have the biological interactions. So you may have a food chain, for example, you've got perhaps phytoplankton, so the plant plankton, which may be consumed by the zooplankton, which is the, the animal plankton, these micro, microscopic organisms in the ocean. And then they then end up being food for something else. So fish like anchovies, for example, that are only eaten by bigger fish and bigger fish and perhaps marine mammals, etc. So you have all these interactions going on. Um, and I, each of these sort of groups we call a different trophic level. So basic group of animals that you know, fit into the food web at one stage and you know, have their own sort of part of the kind of thing they feed on. So as I said, I, I'm a community ecologist and I'm interested in not just working at one of these levels, but I tend to, to work at different levels 
and work on different sorts of organisms. So for example, um, what are called primary producers, so plants, algae, the species that take this energy from the sunlight and they you know, get their energy that way. So algae like this is a porphyra, um, seagrasses. I look at the animals perhaps that eat the algae. So here we've got um, limpets, a type of mollusk, and sort of flattened snail, as it were, and some of these other snails as well. And then perhaps the fish that eat those. So I look across all these different levels, and a lot of the projects I've worked on look at the same sort of questions and the same sort of relationships, but in different parts of the world and with different organisms. Okay, so this all sounds, woohoo, brilliant. <laughs> I'm gallivanting around on beaches and it's all, you know, living the life of Riley. Um, the reality isn't always like that, and hopefully you'll, you'll get a bit of that from the talk today. Um, it's not all blue seawater. I mean, this is actually just seawater over in Micronesia where I've worked. This is the actual colour of the water. It's just amazing, just beautiful. Whereas you work in coastal areas where there are mangroves, you look at Singapore, um, you know, it's more like brown soup. Um, it's just, you know, what's in the water. Um, it's not all, you know, crystal clear everywhere. The reality is that as a field-based ecologist, um, this is true of all science, but field-based ecologists, there are lots of things that you can't control. The weather, people you work with, wild animals, all sorts of things. So, very much as a case of if something's going to go wrong, it probably will go wrong. Um, if you talk to any field ecologist, they'll have been involved in all sorts of studies which just haven't worked out. Um, things break. So, I would say with these four things, some duct tape, zip ties, some plastic bags, and some cage material, I can fix, I don't know what, I reckon I can fix anything with those four things. Okay, the amount of equipment that gets broken, bro boat engines breaking down, um, things drifting off, you know, it, it's very useful, so you have to be very sort of hands-on, um, you know, not just into, into sitting there and looking at the animals. And this has been going on for years, okay? Um, Luckily, we don't make our own diving equipment anymore. And this is a guy called Jack Kitching, um, who is a researcher. Um, he did a lot of work over in the south of Ireland um, quite a few years ago, and also did work in, in, over in the Great Barrier Reef. And they made their own diving equipment. This is actually a milk churn, okay? So this is the containers that people used to collect milk in from farms, um, from the cows, and take them to market. Um, and they've cut a hole and, and welded some glass plates in the front of it. So, very trusting of their own handiwork, I guess. Um, I don't do that. I don't trust myself enough. <laughs> if you're interested in that kind of thing, there, there are plenty of books out here that describe some of the stories of, of, of people you know, who've worked in different areas previously. And there's a book called Stars Beneath the Sea by a guy called Trevor Norton that's, if you're into diving, it's just, just fascinating. Stories about people, eardrums exploding when they're testing equipment, um, whose part of trick would be blowing smoke rings out of the ears from their cigarettes. So just you know, wonderful stuff. But you have to be creative. You have to be able to think in your feet and fix things and deal with things when they go wrong. And it can be tedious, okay? Ecology boils down to counting things at the end of the day. You may come up with all these amazing intricate experimental designs, these amazing survey techniques. You may visit wonderful places. You may be in the deep ocean or on beaches, but you're collecting and you're counting things, which is great. It's interesting. Um, if you're into that particular area. Um, but at the same time, it can get to be a bit too much sometimes. And it's not just me. I mean, this is something that happened and people were quite open about for a long time. Um, this is Charles Darwin, um, without the beard. Um, and you may not know this, but Charles Darwin actually was the world expert on barnacles. So as well as writing Origin of Species, um, he decided that he was become, going to become the number one person in the world looking at barnacles. Um, and he wrote this huge monograph, um, several volumes that really described the biology of barnacles everywhere in the world. Um, so, you know, huge undertaking. This is what Darwin said about barnacles when he was halfway through writing his monograph. I'm at work on the second volume of Cyropedia, which is the scientific name for barnacles, of which creatures I'm wonderfully tired. I hate a barnacle as no man ever, had a, ever did before, not even a sailor in a slow sailing ship. So that's someone who loves what they do, but has got to the point where it's a bit too much. Um, 
You get this feeling, for example, when you're looking through your thousandth gut of a fish for the day and you're smelling a little bit fishy. Um, it, it just gets a bit too much sometimes. So it, it, at the same time, it's also what keeps us going. It's a, it's a funny conundrum that it all becomes a bit too much, but it's also what drives you on. So, you know, you get to live in wonderful places, for example. Um, as a marine ecologist, if you can have the time or you can get the funding, you can indulge your interests. Yeah? If you're interested in an area and you can direct yourself in that direction, there's hopefully nothing to stop you. So if you want to look at development, this is, um, these are egg cases of a pygmy Japanese octopus, octopus parvus, um, which I actually had laid in, well, I didn't lay them myself, but were laid um, in a laboratory in Japan and I watched them develop and hatch out. Um, you, you, know, you can follow what it is you're interested in. It's, it's fantastic. At the same time, the people. You know, we all talk about the animals and the biology, but it's the people you work with as well. Your co-researchers, people you meet at conferences, you know, people who have the same interest in that one particular type of snail. Um, it's just fantastic. I made you know, friends all over the world um, doing this kind of work. It's been great. And also working in different places. And that's, as I said, I'm a bit of an itinerant. I've traveled around the world quite a lot. Um, and you can live and work in amazing places if you want to. I mean, a lot of people stay in one place, but. You know, I've enjoyed seeing the world. And this is the University of Hong Kong as a marine lab where I, I lived. This was my, pretty much my bedroom window view for two and a half years. So it's um, yeah. Hong Kong real estate. I couldn't have afforded that in any way. <laughs> okay, so as I said, I've moved around a lot. Okay, these are just stars of places I've lived. Minimum of three months, but going up to about three or four years. Um, so I started up in the UK, so up here in the northeast. Um, I've worked down the southwest in Plymouth, over in Southern Ireland. Um, I lived and worked in, in Greece for a while when I was a student. And then there's a big gap, and then I'm over in this part of the world. Um, I keep on coming back to the Asia Pacific region in Southeast Asia. Um, it's just a fascinating place to work as an ecologist. In the UK, people have been chronicling patterns, chronicling the species that are there for hundreds of years, um, whereas you know, this area is, I suppose, the area for exploration. Um, you know, we know so little of what we actually have in this part of the world. So I worked in Hong Kong, my PhD, also I'm in Singapore now, and also Japan, it's Micronesia, it's the middle of the Pacific here, and then um, Victorian Australia, which is where I was before I came here. Um, actually, I think if you turn these stars on the side, they actually are the same shape as the stars in the Australian flag, which is a bit of a freaky coincidence. Um, I'm just going to talk today about some work I've done in these three areas because they're to the right. I, mean, I don't know. It took my fancy when I wrote the talk. Um, so I'll start off first of all with Japan. So I was over there for a couple of years. Um, I was working in Kyushu. So we're talking about the um, sort of southern area of the Japanese mainland. And I'll just zoom in a little bit. So this is Kyushu. So you've got Nagasaki. Um, it's around about sort of up, well, up here. Um, you've got um, Fukuoka up here, and then there's Kumamoto along here. I worked on this island here called Amuxa. Um, and in fact, I worked right on that little head. Um, this island, actually, when I was last over there, someone said, how big is this island compared to Singapore? And we looked on Google Earth, and it turns out, if you put Singapore on its end, they're pretty much exactly the same size. <laughs> But there are only a few thousand people living on this island. So it's, it's very rural for Japan. Um, so living in a fishing village and a rural island in Japan, you know, fantastic experience. So this is the headland, um, sort of beautiful coastal area. It's, it's interesting biologically because of where it is in relation to the ocean currents, as we get a lot of warm water species here that don't get any further north. So there are quite a lot of corals, for example, growing in this area. But when I was there, I worked on rocky shores. So my PhD in Hong Kong was looking at what we call the intertidal zone. Okay? So if you think if you go to a beach or a coastline, at high tide, the ocean's up here. At low tide, it drops down. So intertidal between the tides is that area of rock or sand or whatever that's covered by water for half the time, and it's dry land for the other half. Um, it's, it's an interesting place to work because or an interesting part of the ocean, the fringes to work, because it's very inhospitable. If you're an organism living there, you've got to be able to survive 
living underwater and also survive on dry land. It's got two very different environments and all the conditions that are thrown at you because of that. So a lot of my work was carried out around this headland on the rocky shores here. Um, and actually, very luckily, that was my house there, so it was very convenient. Um, and great part of the world, the cheapest, best sushi I will ever have in my life. Um, on a sense, yeah, really, really fantastic. So, Rocky Shores in, in Japan. So I did my PhD on Rocky Shores. And what I was looking at in Hong Kong was um, things like effects of typhoons, you know, why we find species in different areas of the shore. But I always thought, well, at high tide, what happens? You know, a lot of intertidal ecology is done at low tide. People tend to ignore the high tide part, even though it's half of the life of all the animals there. So I was interested in looking at what happens at high tide, and in particular, what predators come in and how they use the area. Now, working in, in rural Japan, um, I don't know how many of you know how things work over there in terms of fisheries, for example. But a lot of the local fishing cooperatives, they have you know, quite a, a stranglehold on what you can and what you can't do in coastal areas. So for example, in a lot of places, you want to collect seaweed from the shore that's washed up after a storm. Where I lived, you could. In other areas down the coast, you couldn't. You needed a license. You needed to pay them a licensing fee. So some of the things you have to do to ingratiate yourself with Japanese fishermen, um, this is me, obviously. Um, this is what's called a Hidaka Matsuri. So this one is held in this small fishing village on this island on the 21st of January every year, which is traditionally the coldest day of the year in Japan. Um, of course, it's traditionally. Um, and we would swim this um, shrine for about a kilometer and a half in the water in January. Then we climb out, and then we walk around about three villages for several hours, taking it to everyone's house um, and drinking vast quantities of shochu. Um, but it meant that people knew who I was and I could get work done. So, you know, you do what you have to do. Terrible. Um, so how did I look at predators? I used different methods. I had cages that I put down with bait in them. I would have large nets, and also I would go snorkeling um, to record fish that were there with video and actually write down what fish were coming up into this area at high tide. So I just want to show you a few of them. Um, they're not quite as dramatic when they're lying here um, as opposed to when they're swimming around. Um, but with a net, you know, what can you do? So at high tide, you find that there are a lot of crabs um, coming up into this intertidal zone. So they're feeding on things like barnacles. Um, you have a variety of different fish species, so your butterfly fish, your fugu, um, some ras species, and also octopus. Okay, this is the Japanese pygmy octopus again. So its mantle length, so from basically the edge of its eyes to the end, is only, let's see, about three centimeters long. So very small, but this is an adult. Um, and these, all these animals come in at high tide, and they feed there. Which, if you don't look at high tide, you think there are no predators, or rather. Low tide. Slightly different group of animals than I imagined when I first went over there. Um, the crabs, again, crabs are happy on walking around on rocks at high tide or low tide. There are quite a few neighborhood cats and um, seem to like to forage around inside rock pools for food. You have a lot of black kites in that part of Japan. I mean, literally thousands of them um, on that headland flying around, which and obviously other birds that feed on organisms at low tide. And also tanuki, okay? It's, it's a tanuki, it's, what, it's a raccoon dog. Um, so it's actually related to a dog, it's not a raccoon. Um, and they, if you go to a Japanese restaurant and you see this sort of funny little bear statue outside sort of beating its stomach, that's a caricature of a tanuki. So there's all sorts of you know, folk tales linked to tanuki, but they're quite voracious. Um, they're omnivores, they eat pretty much anything, and you get them from Japan all the way up through Russia, all the way across to Norway. Um, they've been spread because of the fur farms and escapes and things. So quite a different group of animals, actually, which are you know, eating in the same sort of organisms at low tide. And this is during the day. If you go at night, it changes again. So if you go out in the shore at low tide, the tiniki are ever-present. Um, but the octopus, actually, at low tide, drag themselves round out of the water 
on the rock surfaces trying to find food, which you know, I had never seen before. Um, and then a different variety of crabs. So straight off, using these pretty easy techniques, I was able to determine you know, what was actually feeding them. So you get this sort of thing. So at high tide, you get fish, octopus, crabs, etc., moving up into this area of shore. And at low tide, they've all gone. Um, you have these other species coming in um, from terrestrial areas and actually making use of it. So potentially very important habitat and source of food for a, for a wide variety of organisms. What do they eat? As I said, small town, small village. Um, a lot of people um, live in Japan. A lot of the younger people in this area move to the cities like happens you know, elsewhere in the world. And a lot of people who are living there and have been living there for a long time collect seafood um, from the coast. And so it's a good idea being in their good books as well. So one of the other festivals I was dragged into, um, obviously against my will, I think there have been lots of show too at this stage. So what do they eat? You've got to look at stomach contents. Um, so the way I did this was I would have a large, what we call a fike net. So it's a huge opening. This is about three meters tall, going down a sort of a, a hoop arrangement and a, and a small bag at the end. And I put that out at low tide. I was given the smallest boat in Japan, probably, um, to head out with a fishing net. I drop the nets off the end of this trap, and what happens is you end up with a loop like this, and the fish that go up at high tide, when they try and leave, they all get funneled into this, into this trap. And you can collect the fish and look at what they've eaten. And these are some of the things. And these are some types of prey that we found in a lot of stomachs of a lot of fish um, and crabs, etc. And to scale, this is the end of a pencil here. So another picture. So pretty small animals. So lots of small crabs and shrimps. Um, lots of small gastropods, very small snails. These are called pisiella. Um, small limpets, and lots of barnacles. So this is the stage that Darwin stands up and runs up the room screaming because he's had enough of them. Um, but you'd have, in fact, some very small fish with potentially, so a fish that may be a fugu, for example, that would be, say, 15 centimeters long, may have several hundred of these inside its stomach. So they're feeding predominantly on these, um, these animals. So I know what's coming into the high tide, what's coming into the tidal, what kind of food they're feeding. And the next question was, what does their impact on the organism in the intertidal zone? So back to the people collecting seafood. Um, it's very difficult to do this kind of study in Japan because if you want to see how the distribution of species change because of animals eating them, it's very difficult when you have people collecting them and eating them. Um, so I had to find something that people weren't collecting, and it was the barnacles, <laughs> so, which, which is very fortuitous in this case because it was a major type of food. So what I did was kind of a, a fairly standard ecological method where you want to look at the effect of predators, so you keep them out of an area. So basically you bolt down a cage onto a rock, you keep the predators out, and then you see what the impact is of the organisms living there. Now, keeping predators out can be a bit of a challenge. You can build an octoproof, octoproof, an octopus-proof cage. Um, this, is, this is a cage, a small cage within a larger cage. So the octopus can get its tentacles through, it can grab a snail, but it can't get it to the edge. It's basically bang it on the inner cage. It's how to frustrate an octopus, basically. Um, not very useful in a field situation. So I couldn't look at individual species. I just had to look at general impacts of predators. So I would have a cage like this to keep predators out. And you can see the barnacles of the white dots in the rock here. I'd have a half cage. Um, the reason we use these is because if you want to see that it's the predators having an impact, you don't know whether it's actually just the presence of the cage itself having an impact. So you have a half cage, and then you hopefully um, you can tell Hopefully there'll be no impact on these, even though there's half a cage there. And then you have open areas. So the same size sort of plot um, where predators can get full access. So this was one of the open areas. And you can see all these barnacles here stuck to the rock surface. Um, and lots of free space, lots of gaps. 
Okay? And these sort of gaps are important because animals generally can't settle onto rocky shores unless there's space for them to settle onto. Okay, this is what happened in an area where the predators were kept out of. So you can see the area around where it's patchy, as we saw before. Where the cage was, you got this very dense coverage of barnacles. So you can immediately see that the predators are having an impact on what's on the shore. Um, you're pretty, pretty dramatic for the kind of stuff that, that I do. So just to summarize this a little bit, so two, three, two years. Two years in Japan, um, looking at this, figuring out, okay, what grazers are coming into the shore, what predators are coming into the shore, um, what kind of things they're feeding on, and what the impacts are um, on the community itself. So short piece of work, but you know, a lot of field work involved in it. Great fun, thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, apart from ending up in the hospital because of numerous accidents on field work. Um, so pop that up, good. So moving swiftly along, um, I just want to talk a little bit now about a very different project that I was working with a colleague um, from the University of Hawaii. Um, this was in Micronesia. So we've got Papua New Guinea here. Micronesia is, I can't even see on this one, I'm trying to fall off the stage. Um, this chain of islands, ah, this chain of islands around about here. Okay, um, right in the middle of the Pacific, so pr pretty much halfway between Hawaii and the Philippines. Um, it's not somewhere you end up by accident. You have to be very much wanting to go there because there's a flight that goes from Hawaii and stops off at four islands and ends up in Guam, and then it turns around and comes back. So unless you've got your own luxury yacht, which unfortunately I don't have, but if anyone wants to donate one, then brilliant. Um, you know, it, you don't go there, which... It's fantastic, I would never have gone here if I wasn't doing this job. So to zoom in a little bit, so the island I worked on is called Ponape. Um, it's basically a mountain in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Um, you have these coastal areas of mangrove, where this narrow white band is fringing coral reef. You have a lagoon with lots of patches of coral inside it. And then you have um, these barrier reef areas around the outside. Um, it's a great place to work. And also, I've only shown one island. I would need a, a room much bigger than this to show the whole of Micronesia. You have these atolls, um, these coral atolls um, and lagoons, which are spread out over vast different distances. And this is Ant. This was a, a few hours by boat um, from Micronesia, um, from Ponape, sorry. But there are others which are, you know, several days visit, which people, several days um, journey by ship that several people live on. Um, if any of you have ever heard of Pingalap, there's an island um, in the same chain, which is a small atoll, which pretty much everyone in there is colorblind because it's so cut off and there's that much, um, I suppose, interfamilial relationships. Um, but brilliant place. Things there, because I don't know, probably most of you will never go here. I'll be amazed if anyone goes here. Um, there are ancient ruins on this island. Okay. We think of ancient ruins as you know, the, the pyramids, the Mayan ruins. We've obviously got our ruin, ruins up the coast in Angkor Wat. Um, there are similar ruins on this island um, called Nam Madal, this abandoned city um, made of these huge rocks, um, which have been abandoned for hundreds of years. Um, lots of folk tales, lots of stories, but no one really knows um, what went on there and why it's there. It's basically a lot of artificial man-made islands. Um, and just amazing, you come across it and think, why have I never heard of this before? Um, these rocks, to give you some idea of scale, you talk about almost a metre, um, just diameter at the end of this rock. So they're several metres long. They're absolutely vast. And these would have been moved, well, we don't know, you know by hand, travels, you know, being pulled over logs. It's just, just amazing. Um, other things there, if there are any surface here, um, it's also an amazing place for waves. About once a year, you get these huge surf coming in. Um, I was sitting in the boat and not even thinking about getting out of it at this stage. Um, two days after this photo was taken, the ocean was flat and it was flat for three months. So these are oceanic swirls that come in. So you can imagine the kind of effects they can have on the, the islands. Also wildlife, brilliant place. So this was taken on Ant, so that small atoll, that reef um, off the main island. Coconut crabs, you know, they're huge. Obviously not, not as big as this, but you know, there's a coconut there for scale. They're pretty vast animals. Um, 
You don't tend to get them on the mainland because they're also quite tasty. Um, so it's amazing seeing these things that otherwise you only saw in nature programs. It's not necessarily a paradise though. You know, like everywhere there are issues. Um, one of the issues that I would see day to day would be coral mining. Um, you're in an island in the middle of the Pacific, um, you want to make concrete, you've got a readily available source of lime, basically because you've got the coral, so you have diggers which dig up the old reef, um, tear it up, grind it up, um, and use that in, in cement and concrete. So you, you do have these sort of impacts going on. Okay, other challenges. As I said, you know, working in some places, I've got great friends from, from various places, but it can take a, a bit of time to get to know people. Um, who here is, has anyone here ever traveled in the Pacific? Okay, there's, has anyone heard of Carver? Okay, basically there's, there's a route that if you're on an island in the middle of nowhere, um, as humans do, they tend to find things that make them feel good. Um, and there's a route called, from a plant called Carva in many places, but in, in Ponape they call it Sakao. Um, so it's a large tree route. And basically most places, villages, houses, have these huge flat rocks. And what they do is, with these round rocks, they pound the Sakao and turn it into this, this mush. And then they'll wring out the Sakao by using hibiscus bark, and it produces this sort of horrible, bitter, chocolatey milkshake. It's absolutely disgusting. Um, but it has soporific properties, so people enjoy drinking it um, on a daily basis, pretty much on this island. So about 4.30, 5 o'clock, people finish work, and you can just hear the banging of rocks and the crushing of Sakao root all the way around the island and work basically just stops for the day. Um, so soporific effects, I didn't like it, but this is just for reconstruction, this is kind of what you would look like if you drank any of it. Um, you know, one leg goes one way, one leg goes another way, and yeah, people are incapable of doing anything. So it's, yeah, I, I said I didn't like it, so this was just a just pose photograph. Um, so the reason I was here, apart from avoiding Sakao and, and, and coconut crabs, was the fact that this colleague of mine, who's been going there for many years, is interested in um, conserving grouper. So, coral trout, grouper, groper, whatever you want to call them. Um, which, I mean, this species here, which we worked on, is very common in this part of the world, Southeast Asia. Um, no doubt many of you have actually eaten this, whether you, you know it or not. Um, it's very common in supermarkets and the live reef um, fish trade. And we were interested in looking at management needs for this. It's a very important fishery um, on this island and a lot of others. And one of the interesting things about grouper, a lot of other fish do this, but grouper is that it form what we call spawning aggregations. So rather than having you know, one or two fish spawning and breeding that way, what they do is they form these huge groups of hundreds or thousands or even tens of thousands of individuals and have these mass spawning events. Um, a lot of species of grouper do this, very snapper do this, etc. And stop away from the stage. Um, but why is this interesting? Well, it's interesting to see, and biologically it's very interesting, but it makes these fish very susceptible to fishing pressure. They're not the smartest fish in the sea. If you have thousands of them all in one place, thinking about nothing but breeding, and you have fishermen or fishers at the surface on a boat, lowering down a line with a hook on and some live bait on it, they'll take it as you catch them. And if you do it again, the next one will take it, and the next one will take it, and the next They just don't stop. Um, so what happens is you have these areas which are very important because all of the adults go there to spawn, and if fishermen know where they are, then they go to the same place and can decimate the population. Um, not necessarily over one day, um, but what makes it, I suppose, even more sensitive is that these spawning aggregations only happen for quite distinct periods of time. So over about two or three months, around the full, maybe one or two days either side of the full moon, is when you have these aggregations and these groups forming. Um, so they you know, can be very susceptible. In fact, there are lots of examples around the world where these, this has happened, where too much fishing has happened, Either the fish have completely gone or they've dropped down to such small numbers that 
you know, the reproductive population is basically it's just gone. Um, and there are no examples where this has happened of them ever coming back again. So once they're gone, they're gone. So it, it's in everyone's interest to actually manage them and conserve them. So what we were doing was looking at, my colleagues have been going here for years, looking at these fish. We were very interested in looking at, okay, where are they when they're not spawning, when they're not forming these groups and aggregations? And we didn't know very much about that. And um, also, how much area are they living in? Okay, if you're trying to protect where the fish are, it's, good, it's a good idea to know, do they live in a 100 meter area? Do they live in a thousand, in a kilometer square? Um, and also, you know, to, to, to drag this back and think about it in terms of um, a marine protected area, um, how you design it, um, or how you change the marine protected area that's already there. So this is Ponape again. Um, you're talking probably from here to here in a straight line is about 22 kilometers. Um, and the spawning aggregation we're talking about actually oops, it's happening down here in the bottom left hand corner, the southwest. And there's a couple of small islands there, and one of which I li lived on most of the time I was there. Um, and there is an MPA, there is a marine protected area there. It was set up by a guy um, before I was, went over there, but my friend knew him very well. He was just someone who owned this island and thought the fish were very important and would just chase people off. And he started his own protected area. Um, it's now sort of run, well, managed by the government. Um, but it's very small. It's only less than one and a half kilometers squared in size. It's a very small area. It's only there seasonally. So it's only there when the spawning aggregations are happening. Um, but as well as the species that I'm talking about, there are also a couple of others that also spawn at the same place at the same time. So this is the little island. Um, it's probably about 30 meters long um, that I've spent quite a lot of time on. Um, so you go a little bit stir crazy, but hey, it's all part of the experience. Um, and catching the fish, um, we wanted, what we did is we were looking, we wanted to track the fish. We wanted to know where they were going and when they were going there and wanted to find them again. So to do that, we needed to catch them. Um, I'm not a very good fisherman, um, and even if I was, I don't think I'd have much luck. It's, a, it's very much a skill that these guys have where they'll be floating around a snorkel off the outside of the reef. The water will be maybe 60 meters deep. Um, they dangle a long line down below them with these live fish on them, these small fish, um, and dangle them in front and catch them which is a skill in itself, but also pulling them up quickly enough so that the sharks don't eat them um, is even more of a skill. So these were you know, a lot of sharks here, which were, um, you, know, you quite often get half a fish when you got to the top, um, especially if we did it. So these guys are really good at catching it, um, these fish. So we catch them, um, we'd anesthetize them. So basically we put them in a bath of seawater with some anesthetic. They fall asleep pretty much instantly. Um, we put a very small incision and insert this transmitter. So these transmitters that are acoustic transmitters, they send out this pulsing sound, which can, we can then pick up with an underwater microphone, what we call a hydrophone. And each tag, so there's an acoustic tag, each tag, it sends out sort of a, a different rate of pulses, um, and that actually has a number encoded in it, you know, almost like Morse code, that sort of thing. And it means that if you stick um, a microphone, a hydrophone over the side of the boat and you hear the, the beeping that these tags produce, you know which fish it is that you can hear. So you can actually you know, you know which number it is. That's number five, that's that fish. It's a you know, really useful technology. Ponape, I mentioned earlier on, it's a mountain in the middle of the ocean. Um, there's a bit of a discussion about whether this is, well, the statistics, but I think there's a competition at the moment between Hawaii and Ponape about whether they're the wettest place on the planet. You think about a, a, a mountain in the Pacific Ocean, it's basically a cloud magnet. So any clouds going that direction hit the island and just empty themselves out. And this is every day. So think about the monsoon rains, the rains we have every day around about lunchtime, um, which can make things a bit challenging if you're working with electronics. Um, so you have to keep everything dry. So you've got a receiver that takes, you know, if you have your microphone, a sort of receiver that decodes the signal, um, and you, you try not to, to lose that. So, yeah. 
once more, um, it's all, all good fun most of the time. Other things that can go wrong. As I said, you can't control for many things. Um, this was when I was doing this work. Um, coastal fisheries are very important for the islanders, but the government rents out the offshore fisheries to China and Japan. So the tuna fisheries, so the ocean-going fish that are further offshore, are generally caught by large factory ships from China or Japan. Um, they operate pretty much year-round in this part of the world. So the way they're transported back to the canning factories or, or wherever, are by these charter planes. So planes come in every couple of weeks, land on the island, fill up literally to the roof with fish, and then take off and, and take them wherever it is in the world. Um, this one, the pilot landed fine, um, but didn't manage to stop um, as well. And this is the end of the runway here, um, and he fell off the end of it. Um, I don't think he'd be very popular with the company he worked for. And also he wasn't very popular on the island because the island only has one runway. It's too far to get a helicopter to, so basically it meant there was no air traffic to the island for a couple of weeks. Um, and in fact, they were talking, looking at what machinery they had on the island to pull this back. Um, there wasn't, and eventually they had to cut it into pieces. Um, and basically it was just a plain scrap, so ruined. So I'm guessing that guy lost his job. But the reason that affects me is because I was working with um, guys from the marine department, the fisheries department, and they were, when this happened, all sent, ordered to go there to protect the plane. I'm not sure what they were protecting the plane from. Um, it wasn't going anywhere, but they were there protecting the plane for two weeks. So, you know, those kind of effects, if it's people who help you drive boats, people who help you diving, you know, you just can't control that. So you just grin and smile and things get on with things. Other issues, um, a bit more costly, this one for us anyway. Um, at the same time as we were going around on a little boat, what we do is every day, I get in a little um, three meter long boat, we'd chug around inside the lagoon. Um, and if this is you know, 25 or so kilometers, you can imagine it's a huge area to cover with a microphone listening for beeps. Um, the first few weeks, nothing. Every day, listening to nothing, drifting around, listening to zero. Um, it gets to you a bit until you hear the first one, and it's like, oh, yes, we found one. Um, at the same time as we were doing that, we also were mooring these, um, fall off, these um, base stations. Basically, these are um, tubes that are probably that long, um, which include a hydrophone and a small microcomputer. And any time a fish that we tagged swims past it, it records that signal and we know the fish has gone past. The reason we use these is we could actually put them at the channels, at the entrances, through the reef, and hopefully get an idea, a bit more idea on the fish movement. Um, because we, we were thinking that perhaps you have you know, fish grouping in these areas. Unfortunately, because we work with the government, um, the local fishermen thought we were doing something to stop them fishing, which wasn't the case. And these are moored on the outside of the reef um, in at least 30 metres of water. Okay? So the rope will go down at least 30 metres. Which, bearing in mind, this room is about 5 metres. Um, it's a long way. And these guys don't use diving equipment. They snorkel. And what happened, the local fishermen, the spear fishermen, were swimming down 30 metres at least, cutting these lines at the bottom, and then this equipment was just drifting off into the Pacific Ocean. So this was tens of thousands of dollars of equipment we'd lost um, overnight. So you obviously get upset, but there's nothing you can do about it. You just, you know, if you get angry or shout at people, then you, you get nothing done ever. So you just have to grin and bear it. Um, but we tagged um, about 15 fish, and of the fish we tagged, so we caught these fish when they were spawning or just before they spawned. We put transmitters in males, transmitters in females, they swam off and then we tried to find them, which um, needle in the haystack is the least of your worries. Um, we found that the first time we tagged them, so we tagged them in April, during around about the full moon, um, was that within two days they'd gone. So they, they spawned, they released their eggs and sperm, um, and they disappeared off to wherever it was they were living. In May, so we had males and females, we did this to tag at this time. In May, um, the full moon, Males came back, but there were no females. So the males were a bit, bit optimistic. You get some um, 
fishy love, I guess. Um, and they were coming back to these areas in the hope that there'd be females to breed with, um, but there wasn't. So this is kind of the, we were working really at this, the end of the spawning season, which was good because we wanted to know where they were when they weren't spawning. So I gave an example um, before. So this is one female traveled all the way up here, which is a straight line that's about 22 kilometers. Um, we don't know whether she went through the passes because we lost our equipment because it was cut off. Um, but that's you know, quite a large distance to travel um, for one fish. And then looking at the fish when it got there, so we had quite a few fish that we managed to find again. Um, we were finding that they were in water between like 10 to 50 meters, but they were only in areas that are a couple of hundred meters in area. So they have these very um, distinct coral patches that they would hang on, hang out on and live on when they weren't breeding. But a lot of the males, um, they actually live very close to spawning aggregation, which I guess if they're always looking for females, it probably makes good sense. So in terms of what this actually does, um, we found out where the fish were going. We found out that the reserve that was there already um, basically isn't enough. You could protect a much bigger part of the population if you looked at 200 to 300 kilometers squared, but that's never gonna happen. Um, it's just unrealistic. But basically, if there, was, if there wasn't some sort of modification and an increase in the size of this reserve, then, and if the fishing pressure stays the same, then the likelihood is that this, this was, um, spore aggregation would disappear as well. So this was a few years ago. I've got this friend who's still going there, um, and they are making headway. So they've got a lot of the villagers and the fishermen and the elders involved at how they can manage this. Okay, what time is it? Okay, I'll whisk through one more example. Is everyone up for that? Or if not, I can stop now. <laughs> People still awake, okay. Um, before I came here, different time of study again. Um, ended up in Australia. So down in Victoria, in the south of Australia. Um, in close to Melbourne. So there's this bay, this little black spot here, um, was where I was living. And um, which if you zoom in on, um, it's a place called Port Villa Bay. So there's a huge bay, it's about 2,000 kilometers squared in area. You've got about 4 million people living in, in Melbourne along this northern area in, in Geelong. Um, and it's interesting because it's, it's just connected by a very narrow tidal channel. It's three kilometers across. Um, so, you know, fish movement is restricted in and out of this. It also means it's a very good harbor. And the reason we were doing the work was that, oh, I'll, go in, I'll get into that in a second. I'll get into the reason for the work in a second. Um, beautiful place, um, some amazing animals live there. So we have a weedy sea dragon, um, which is basically a, a straightened out seahorse, I guess. Um, amazing animals, you may see them in aquariums in different places. And this is taken by a colleague of mine, just pretty much at the, the beach along from where we lived. Um, you have fairy penguins, or little penguins, depending what part of the world you call them, um, which you would see when you're on boats surveying this, skimming around under the water surface looking for fish. Um, it's a brilliant place, brilliant place to work, brilliant place to live. Um, and we were interested in this particular study in looking at, well, fish again in this case, but how fish use seagrass beds. Okay, seagrass beds, so seagrass is it's a plant, it's, a, it's a, you know, close to a grass. It's not an algae, it's a plant that actually grows um, underwater. Um, it can be very important as what we call a nursery ground. Okay, a lot of fish, when they're a juvenile or larval stage, um, will use the seagrass as shelter from predators, to hide from predators. They'll use it um, as a source of food. There are lots of little crunchy critters that live on the seagrass itself they can feed on. Um, and we wanted to look at the fish living there. So the reason, I was saying, was that it's in a very big shipping port in Melbourne. Um, the problem with Port Phillip Bay, if you have a large container ship, is it's actually very shallow in a lot of places. The maximum is about 20 meters deep. Most places it's only about six or seven meters. It's very shallow. So you have to dredge a channel so you can get your big container ships actually through and end up to the harbor. Um, so there's a lot of dredging going on. And when you dredge, so when you basically dig up the sediment and create this channel which you can then drive ships down, you do this, you create what we call a plume. So the sediment becomes suspended in the water column and it generally drifts in currents and it ends up somewhere else. The concern was that this sediment um, would end up in these areas with seagrass, it would settle out 
and it would smother the seagrass, it would cover the seagrass grass and kill it, and also it would mean there would be nowhere for these fish to live. Um, and quite a few commercial species of fish in this area are reliant on seagrass. We already know that from past research. So what we did is we looked at differences, so there were multiple sites, we looked at differences between shallow seagrass, so this is seagrass, this is a place called Bird Island, um, this is shallow seagrass which is probably about a metre deep in, a, in water that gets up to about a metre or two metres deep, and it goes about you know, five metres or so off the coast, or so, well, sorry, about 10, 20 metres off the coast, and we looked at seagrasses in deeper water, so between about eight and 15 metres. It's actually the same species of seagrass, um, just because of the way the sediment is, that it can grow in, in certain places. And the concern was that, you know, what happens if we have sediment settling out in deep water? Or alternatively, what happens if we have sediment settling out in, in shallow water? You know, are the fish communities different in those two different places? So we wanted to see, first of all, what are the fish communities? Um, we knew pretty much nothing about these deeper seagrass areas. Um, so we want to know if they're different. Do we have the same fish in shallow and, and deep sea, seagrass areas? And also, are they both important as these nursery grounds that I was talking about? Sampling methods. They must have heard some from Japan, because in Australia they found an even smaller boat to stick me on. Um, going out fishing nets again. So what we do is we, we draw out from a, a vessel that was moored off the shore. We drop 20 meter or so fishing nets with a very fine mesh. Um, and then we drag them back through the seagrass onto the boat again and collect all the fish that were in there. So just to quickly show you some, some more important species. So in shallow seagrass, we found lots of, for example, this is King George Whiting, um, which is a very important fish commercially and also for recreational fishers um, in that part of Australia. It's very tasty. It's a local fish and chip shop and um, very, very nice. Um, these are the larvae. They settle out in Port Phillip Bay into shallow seagrass areas and it's a very important habitat for them in this particular part of Australia. Also, you get rarer species. This is a wide-bodied pipefish, so another straightened-out seahorse, um, which are you know, gazetted as being endangered species in this area. Look at the deep sea grass, and you find some crossover, but you also find a lot of very different species. So we found there appear to be nursery grounds for some of the leather jacket species, um, and also the home to rare species as well. So this is um, a small little, little clingfish. Um, this is probably only, let's think, about two centimeters long. Um, you know, beautiful little thing. Um, it's been photographed before. This is from a, a textbook I took this. Um, but it's not got a name. It's not, been, not got a scientific name yet. It's undescribed. Um, there are quite a few species like that. So potentially these this deep areas you know, are very important as well for, for, for different species. Now, you may have looked at me on that little boat and thought, wait a second, there's a bit of a hole here. How is this guy on this tiny little boat going to put a net around some of these larger, faster moving fish? Um, the answer is I couldn't. Okay, they're much too quick for me, they saw me coming. So we need to use another method to look at what large fish are there. So we use what we call stereo video. And this is a really sort of nifty um, type technology where you have a, a nice big frame, in this case, have two video, waterproof video cameras, and they're both focused on a point, say, that far in front of the cameras. They're at slightly different angles and pointing towards each other, um, and you can use that to actually figure out a few different things when you actually look at the video. Um, in the center, you'll see this looks like a bit of a torch. It actually has a flashing light, um, and the way this works is when you use your computer software to look at the two sets of video, you want to be able to synchronize them. So they're exact, you're looking exactly the same frame from the left camera and the right camera at the same time. So every second or so, there's a little light on there which flickers around and moves to a different position, and you can use that to synchronize the videos when you watch them. And what you can do with that is, with you know, nice um, flashy software, is not only can you obviously collect pictures and videos of the fish, but you can also measure the fish. Okay, the technology allows you to actually measure the length. So down to sort of millimeter um, and sub-millimeter accuracy, they're amazingly accurate. Um, it's a very useful way to monitor the larger fish, which can get away from me in a rowboat, um, and you know, non-destructive. Um, not so good for the very small fish, because a very small fish in a video just looks like a very small fish. You really can't tell them apart. 
Okay, let's see if this works. So this is just a bit of video showing you, um, as well as looking between deep and shallow seagrass, we're interested in whereabouts in the seagrass patches um, these fish hang out. And this is a King George whiting. Um, the seagrass is over here on this side, obviously the green, and we have sandy areas out here. So we were looking at how much time these fish were spending in the middle of seagrass patches, and whether they were spending a lot of time on the boundary, on the edges of seagrass patches, or whether they were spending a lot of time in, in the sand and the sediment. Okay, so we have, is a King George Whiting gracefully swimming around a seagrass patch. Um, and this size, these adults do appear, well, they do favor, um, let me play that again. Um, they do favor the edge of seagrass patches. Okay, so by using these different techniques, we're able to look at the fact that there are you know, quite different and distinct um, communities of fish in the shallow and deep. So depending if one of, either one of them got buried by sediment, there would be potentially quite large impacts um, on the populations. Um, we found that shallow seagrass, we knew this already to a certain extent, but it's very important as nurseries commercial species, but more important than deep seagrass beds. And also, which I didn't talk about, um, you know, fish abundance is related to, to seagrass structure. Um, and this all has implications for, you know, fisheries management, for the way that the, the port was being dredged and things. At least that was the idea anyway. So, so why is this all important? I mean, me as a marine scientist, there's still the nine-year-old bouncing up and down with joy for doing this kind of stuff. Um, but, you know, the results um, are useful and they are used for things. Um, the sort of basic ecological research, so describing where species are found and when they're found there, it's very important to help us understand how species are distributed in a natural habitat and what kind of changes happen in the natural system. Because if we don't do that, then determining whether a change we're seeing is because of a human impact, like an oil spill or dredging, for example, you know, without looking at having a control, these natural systems to compare against, you don't know whether what you're seeing is because of what you think is a human disturbance or whether it just happens, at, you know, for example, seasonally every year anyway. And this basically has implications for management. So if you're someone who's a fisheries manager, so there's a lot of management of the Australian fisheries where you have government departments um, trying to manage what's caught and when it's caught and how much is caught to keep it sustainable in the long term. And also if you're trying to be a national parks manager, understand these things is important. You know, these little fish, birds eat the fish, for example, on Bird Island. And also coastal development. So for example, areas like Singapore, we've got a lot of dredging, a lot of reclamation in coastal areas. You know, knowing if you do have these very important resources, how to you know, at least mitigate the damage that you may be causing um, is also you know, vitally important. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I think I've kept you far too long. Um, these are just a few of the organizations I've worked with um, over the years um, in those spots I showed you on the map. There are many others. I'd, I'd put pictures of everyone up there, but there would be several talks in itself. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's great. Um, if anyone here is actually thinking of going in this direction, um, I'd say if me as a nine-year-old jumping around the Northeast Coast can do it, then anyone can. Um, you know, so you know, follow your passions, I guess. Um, Công ty Tân Đại Dương là một trong những công ty du học đầu tiên và hàng đầu tại Việt Nam, được thành lập bởi đội ngũ các nhà quản lý và tư vấn du học có nhiều năm kinh nghiệm trong ngành giáo dục cũng như được tu nghiệp và đào tạo ở nước ngoài. Với hơn 10 năm kinh nghiệm, Tân Đại Dương tự hào là nhà tư vấn du học chuyên nghiệp cho các du học sinh tại các nước trên thế giới, đặc biệt là Mỹ, Úc, Singapore, Anh Quốc, Hà Lan, Thụy Sĩ v.v. Cùng với đội ngũ tư vấn viên chuyên nghiệp, chúng tôi cung cấp các dịch vụ uy tín và trọn gói cho ngành du học du lịch Mỹ, bao gồm xử lý trọn bộ hồ sơ đi Mỹ từ A đến Z, kể cả các hồ sơ khó đã từng rớt visa hoặc không đủ tài chính. Tư vấn chọn trường tại tất cả các tiểu bang ở Mỹ, chúng tôi tự hào là đại diện chính thức của hàng trăm trường đại học cao đẳng, trung học phổ thông tại Mỹ. Hướng dẫn các thủ tục xin visa, chứng minh tài chính, hướng dẫn điền form, dạy phỏng vấn du học, du lịch Mỹ. Khai giảng hàng tháng các lớp học phỏng vấn, đảm bảo cho học sinh có được sự tự tin trả lời được mọi câu hỏi của lãnh sự quán. Đặt vé máy bay, sắp xếp nhà ở, ký túc xá cho du học sinh. Với phương châm hoạt động là uy tín, chất lượng và mong muốn định hướng cho học sinh Việt Nam một nền giáo dục tiên tiến, môi trường học tập và sinh hoạt an toàn, Tân Đại Dương cam kết sẽ là người bạn đồng hành cùng học sinh Việt Nam trên đường tới chân trời tri thức. Mọi chi tiết xin liên hệ công ty Tân Đại Dương chuyên du học Mỹ, mặt tiền 148/1 Trần Quang Khải, phường Tân Định, quận Nhất, thành phố Hồ Chí Minh, điện thoại 0838484989098900, website www.tandaidung.edu.vn.